Hi there, I'm Salim Ismail from Singularity University, and I'm sitting with Andrew Hessel, who gave an amazing talk today on synthetic biology. Uh, Andrew, thanks for being with us. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm dying. I've got a bunch of burning questions around uh, how you're doing what you're doing and what synthetic biology is all about. And uh, there's a lot of people who are very curious, so I'll jump straight into it. Um, can you describe it in a few sentences, what synthetic biology is? Synthetic biology is uh, really genetic engineering. Um, genetic engineering, is a, has, as we've called it in the past, is really more of an art form. We're putting a true engineering layer on it now. And that means being able to stand on the work done by others, being able to abstract it across different layers, and to realize real innovation faster and faster, building on the past. The core piece of equipment that's making this possible is a DNA synthesizer. It's driving it, turning biology really into an IT industry. A DNA synthesizer is a printer for DNA. Uh, it's automated. We, if you can type genetic code on a computer, ATGC, uh, when you send it to a DNA synthesizer, it will assemble it. Wow. Um, the, the layman on the street, what practical impacts of synthetic biology will he see in the next five to ten years? I think they'll see more and more. If you look around today, uh, really living organisms are the last thing that we've engineered on the planet. Everything else is pretty much synthetic. Drew Endy points this out in a lot of his work when in his teaching. You know, that we're sitting on an engineered floor, on engineered chairs. Everything in this room has been engineered except for the living organisms. Now that all the barriers are falling away to engineering bacteria, viruses, and much higher organisms, we're really creating a parallel biology, one that's moving at about 100 million years of evolutionary time each calendar year. So we'll see a wide variety of new applications coming out around the world. It's only limited by creativity. And do you use computers extensively in what you do? In pretty much every step of the way. Almost everything is stored on computers. DNA code is difficult to read by eye, so we use computer software for that. We have computer-assisted design tools for, for genetic code. And we do all the modeling of the metabolism that we're creating in computer software as well. And what are some of the recent major breakthroughs in synthetic biology? Well, uh, you might have seen that Craig Venter recently synthesized the entire bacterial genome with uh, these technologies. We're getting to the point where we can produce virtually any virus or small microbe with these technologies at a, at an inc uh, at a cost that's falling uh, by about half every 10 months. So it's really accelerating quickly. And this is opening up new application spaces. Essentially, we're writing genomic programs. So essentially, you can, once you've modeled uh, a, d a DNA, you can essentially program a, a new life form out of new DNA from scratch. Right, and there's two different things. We actually, if, if we're not writing a full genome, but just adding a new, essentially, uh, program to the operating system. We're just changing metabolism. But the beautiful thing about life is because it self-replicates, if we write a full genome, then we actually get to replicate the hardware as well as the software. Wow. Now, what are some of the major developments that you expect to see in the coming future? Well, I expect that we're going to get very good at, at programming living things to make a wider and wider range of, of materials, either chemical compounds, um, or, or um, essentially new structural materials as well. Remember, wood is, is really an output of, of metabolism. We can now make cells produce drugs, new structural materials of all type, and many new compounds. So I like to say that everything that we've made chemically, we're going to start making biochemically. And this is powerful because we don't need very high temperatures, very high pressures, toxic catalysts, for example, and it all runs on sugar or sunlight. And presumably uses much less energy than conventional chemical processes today. Much less, because many of them need to be at high temperatures and pressures to work. All this happens in the same, essentially, uh, environment that we live in. Wow. Now, you, you're doing something unique with Pink Army Cooperative. You're essentially open sourcing all of your work. Uh, and could you talk about that? The Pink Army Cooperative is, is uh, an organization I've created to, to radically ch sh upshift drug development. We know that it takes about 10 to 15 years to make a drug and, and an investment of over a billion dollars. But that's largely because we've been caught in a certain drug, drug development model, producing one therapy for many people. 
But today the technologies allow us to customize therapies at extremely low cost. And so we've kind of rebooted the process by focusing on diseases that are unique in every individual, cancer, and by being able to put together a process by which we can make customized therapies faster and cheaper each time. So the first time we do it, it's expensive, but it, it ends up getting, uh, the prices fall uh, at essentially Moore's Law rates as we move forward. How many synthetic biologists like yourself are there in the world today? Uh, uh, an increasing number of them. Uh, the MIT International Genetically Engineered Machines Program actually attracts students that are interested in this. Uh, we're training somewhere, uh, this last year there was about 1,500 students that went through the program and it doubles uh, um, approximately every year now. Um, okay. So it's growing quickly. Um, as, as well as uh, there are actual PhD programs and master's programs, so uh, it's growing internationally very quickly. This is a growing part of the biotech industry, which is, you mentioned, $76 billion? Uh, approximately, uh, it's actually, it can be more than that. Uh, cancer spending is, is approximately $80 billion a year. Just uh, the NIH budget alone is about $30 billion a year now. Uh, internationally, we spend a, a, a tremendous amount on biotechnology and medicine development. We find today that it's about 50% of it is moving into industrial processes. Agricultural biotech is growing very quickly. This, is, uh, this will be rivaling the uh, IT industry in terms of overall dollars within 10 years. And instead of programming computers, you're essentially programming DNA and life. Exactly. DNA is the source code of life. Um, you had a fabulous analogy at the end of the talk around uh, BMW fixing versus destroying. I w if you wouldn't mind repeating that for the viewers. Yeah, um, my, my opinion has been that cancer is the low-hanging fruit in terms of any type of human therapeutic um, because we're not trying to fix anything. We're actually just trying to selectively kill cells in much the same way as we might if we had a bacterial infection. The, dif the difference is we have very specific antibiotics but we've never been able to make a really specific cancer therapy. But when people talk about gene therapies versus uh, a cancer therapy, it's the difference between trying to fix a cell and ultimately destroy it. And so I use the example of a BMW. A BMW is an extremely complex machine, as is a cell. If the BMW isn't working properly, trying to repair it requires very sophisticated equipment and training very difficult to do. But if you're just trying to destroy a BMW, basically an eight-year-old year with a hammer, uh, that car will never run again. Very much the same thing with cancer. We need very crude tools that just work very specifically. That's great. Thank you so much for your time and thank you again for that lecture this afternoon. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here.